What's up, future respiratory therapists? In this video, we're talking all about the flow waveform during mechanical ventilation. Not just to help you recognize what mode of mechanical ventilation you are in, but also to help you recognize a key hazard associated with mechanical ventilation when taking care of some of our obstructive lung disease patients, as well as all patients. The flow waveform. Let's dive in. Okay, so again, this video is all about the flow waveform, talking during mechanical ventilation. We know there's multiple waveforms, but this one is specifically about the flow waveform here, okay? Now, let's just talk about the different shapes that you might see first of all. So this first line right here illustrates for you several different shapes that can be present during mechanical ventilation when you look at your flow waveform. Now, believe it or not, these shapes will help you decipher which mode of mechanical ventilation you are in. Now, I know what you're thinking. Well, the vent will tell me what mode I'm in, and that's true. But when you take that therapist multiple choice exam, that TMC exam, to get your RRT, you may be shown a waveform and asked what mode you are in. So it's very important to understand these concepts right here. Now, what we see first here is that we have a square waveform. Now, a square waveform is also called a constant flow pattern. This is associated with volume control. So if you see a square flow waveform pattern or a constant flow waveform pattern, then you know you're in volume control and you're going to see a slow rising pressure waveform that we discussed in the last video that accompanies this. Now the next one here is called a decelerating waveform. Now yes, there's a partially decelerating waveform, but this one you can see comes up, decelerates, and then exhalation begins. This is decelerating. Now here's what you want to recognize. Decelerating can be volume control. It can be. But if it is accompanied by a square pressure waveform, then you are 100% in pressure control. So this is volume control or pressure control. But remember this, and if you're taking notes, write this down. Pressure control is always a decelerating flow pattern always. Now this next one we see here is a sinusoidal pattern. It's very rounded. You can tell it looks very different than these very structured square and decelerating patterns. This is associated with spontaneous breaths. So when you have somebody in a mode that allows for true spontaneous breaths to happen, you're going to find a much more um, softer a sinusoidal type appearance in your flow waveform. Now, it doesn't mean that it's going to always be so rounded. It may be something more like this. And you can say, well, that looks decelerating. Well, it does look decelerating, but it's not so structured as this one. This one looks like a machine is in control, and it is because that's a machine controlled breath, either in volume control or pressure control. So you can see it's just kind of a softer appearance. You would say that this is more sinusoidal and you're in a spontaneous mode, such as SIMV or perhaps CPAP. And yes, you could be having also pressure support with this breath, but pressure support is going to create a square pressure waveform. It's not going to affect the spontaneous flow pattern that is established, okay? We'll talk more about that here in a little bit when we get to our questions. Now, when you troubleshoot the flow waveform, and before we go much further, let me just clarify this. How do I know I'm looking at the flow waveform? The flow waveform is the only waveform that comes up above on inspiration and then back down below the x-axis on expiration. So, inspiration, expiration. That's important because when we look here, we see that a breath goes in, comes down, and then exhale back to baseline. Now, right now, we know that because this is a square pattern, we are not in pressure control. 
This is a volume control breath because remember, pressure control is always decelerating. But what happens when we see something like this? What happens when we see breath goes in, breath comes out, we're exhaling, but we fail to return to baseline. When I say baseline, I'm talking about the x-axis, which is zero. No flow happening. You see, when this comes back and doesn't reach baseline, then we know that there is still expiratory flow coming out when this next breath started. That's air trapping. So, anytime the flow pattern does not return to baseline on the expiratory side, you know your patient is air trapping. Now the question is, is how do we fix that? Well, there's five different ways that we can fix air trapping, okay? And we'll break these down for you. Let's look at them here. The easiest way, when we are in volume control and we are controlling flow, then we can increase flow. Now what this does is increasing flow decreases eye time. If we decrease eye time, then that equals an increase in our expiratory time, which means we'll have a longer time to exhale, which is exactly what this patient needs. We need more time for this to get back to baseline. So we need to increase the flow. That is one way we can do that. Now the next way we can do that is we can decrease tidal volume. If we decrease the amount of volume we're putting in, then eye time again gets shorter because we're not putting in as much volume. So eye time decreases again. Decrease in eye time equals an increase in E time. This is true. Now the third way we can do this is we can decrease our respiratory rate or we can decrease our frequency. This is the set frequency by the mechanical ventilator. But here's the interesting thing. Decreasing the respiratory rate has no effect on eye time. So how does it affect and help with air trapping? Well, it's very simple. Decreasing respiratory rate will increase your total cycle time. In doing so, will increase your I time. I'm sorry, increase your E time. So we can increase total cycle time. Well, what does that mean? Well, just think about this. Let, let's give you an example here. You have a patient on a respiratory rate that's 20, okay? Now, when you think about this, that means there's gonna be a breath coming every three seconds. Well, how do you know that, Joe? Well, because total cycle time says if you divide 60 seconds, which is one minute, by your respiratory rate, it'll tell you how often it's coming. So 60 divided by 20 equals a breath every three seconds. Fantastic. So now let's decrease this to 10, to 10 breaths per minute. Decrease your respiratory rate to 10. Okay. Now 60 divided by 10 means we have a breath happening every six seconds. You can see where when your eye time stays constant. So let's just say we have a, let's just say we had a one second eye time. Then here we had one second in inspiration and two seconds in expiration. We reduced to 10 breaths per minute and now we have one second in inspiration, which gives us five seconds in expiration. And that indeed increases our expiratory time. More time for the air to leave the patient's alveolar units and come to a state of zero so that we reduce air trapping. Now the next thing here is we can add or we can increase peak. Now this is very, very beneficial when we're talking about our emphysematics because our emphysematics are obstructive lung disease patients who have 
uh, floppy distal airways. They've, they've, they've lost their rigidity and on expiration, they have a tendency to collapse prematurely. So what happens here, I'll illustrate it for you down here. What happens is, is that when the alveoli inflate and then this is inspiration and then during exhalation, they are now getting smaller. Well, the distal airways collapse. So you can see where they've fallen on top of one another. Well, look what happens here. All the air is trapped in that alveoli. So what we know is that if we can increase PEEP to overcome airway resistance, then we can keep these alveoli propped open, these, these distal airways here. We can keep them propped open and allow for better, complete, more complete alveolar exhalation so that this gas doesn't get trapped behind the collapse of the distal airways. We can do the same thing with asthma. When we have an increase in airway resistance, we can match or overcome that airway resistance and it will allow for more complete emptying of the alveoli. Guess what? This is actually what we call pursed lip breathing. When we teach our, our obstructive lung disease patients to breathe in through their nose, out through their lips, what does that do? That creates a back pressure that stents open distal airways and alveoli to allow for a more complete opening, a more complete exhalation. That's what's happening right here. We're just adding PEEP because when you have somebody intubated, they cannot purse lip breathe. The PEEP becomes the mechanism for purse lip breathing. So that's what we're looking at there, okay? So we can add or increase PEEP. Now recognize that this does nothing to eye time or E time. It just stints open the airways for better emptying of the alveoli. Now the last thing we can do is we can administer a bronchodilator. This would be something like a beta-2 agonist like albuterol or Zopinex, either of those two. What happens here is these obstructive lung disease patients who are presenting with air trapping are air trapping because of an obstructive lung disease process. So such as an asthmatic where they have bronchoconstriction happening, if we can open up those airways, then air is allowed to be exhaled at a greater rate and we can reduce air trapping that away as well. So these are five ways. Now you may be asking yourself, okay, so which one is the right way? Well, it depends on your patient presentation. I can tell you that when we look at number one, this is often a preferred choice over two or three, and here's why. If we decrease tidal volume, we decrease minute volume. If we decrease minute volume, then CO2 might go up, pH might go down. That's the way that works. Same thing with decreasing respiratory rate. If we decrease respiratory rate, then we decrease minute volume. If minute volume goes down, CO2 goes up, pH goes down. So you recognize that while these two here are serving the purpose of fixing air trapping or correcting air trapping, they could lead to an acid-base disturbance, which is why we can increase the flow and it has no effect on minute volume. It will decrease our eye time, lengthen our E time. And maybe we need to do that in conjunction with increasing our adding peep or administering a bronchodilator. So a couple, several different ways that you can think about. You can think about fixing or correcting auto peep or air trapping. You just gotta know how and what they do so that we don't put our patient in a bind from the removal of CO2 perspective, okay? Now, that's really what you need to know about the flow waveform, but let's look at some questions here and see if we can identify um, the correct answer in these scenarios. So this first one here is you are caring for a patient receiving mechanical ventilation when you observe the following airway graphics. Which mode of mechanical ventilation is the patient receiving? So you see this question is going to, it's not going to be about air trapping. The question is, is identify the mode using the airway graphics. So let's see what the airway graphics are. 
Okay, so we have, what we notice here is square pressure waveforms, but we see that they are not all the same. These two are the same, but this one is different, okay? Well, let's go down here and look at our flow pattern. We see a decelerating pattern here. And then we see a sinusoidal, and then we see another decelerating. Very cool. This is very, very telling to us. Pressure control waveforms are always square. So just from the waveforms we see here, we're thinking that we are in pressure control. And then we see decelerating and decelerating, and it supports that we indeed are in pressure control. What we notice here though, is that this one is different and we have a different waveform. Well, remember I told you that this equaled spontaneous. All right, so what we see here is we have pressure control breaths with spontaneous breaths accompanied by a square pressure waveform. So let's look at the answers here. Volume control, SI and V with pressure support. It's not volume control, so it's not that one. Pressure control, AC with PSV. Well, remember, if it was pressure control, we would have square waveforms. So perhaps that's the correct answer. We'll come back to it. This might be a good answer, okay? We also see we have pressure control, SI and V with pressure support. Oh, well, that's pressure control. That's true too. So this one might be a good answer too. So let's look at this last one here. CPAP with pressure support. Well, we're not in CPAP because we clearly see that we have two mandatory breaths controlled by the vent. So we're not CPAP because CPAP would have all breaths appearing like this. They would be all spontaneous. So it's not CPAP. So the question now is, is, is it AC or is it SIMV? Well, here's how you know that B is the wrong answer. It is not B. Because if you were in assist control, then this breath right here <clears throat> would have looked just like the first and the third breath. Because in assist control, all breaths will look identical because the vent is in control of every single breath. The patient can trigger a breath, but beyond that, the ventilator takes control of that breath. The other thing we know is that when you're in assist control, there are no true spontaneous breaths. And so pressure support is not a part of that conversation. So it's not B. The answer here is C. We are in pressure control, SIMV, with pressure support. How do we know that? Because we have mandatory breath, mandatory breath, and then a spontaneous breath in the middle, which means that when the patient initiates a breath in between mandatory breaths, they can take a true spontaneous breath. And we know it's augmented by pressure support because of the square waveform there. So this is SIMV, pressure control, with pressure support on the spontaneous breaths. Let's look at another practice question here. You're caring for a patient receiving mechanical ventilation when you observe the following airway graphics. Which of the following is the appropriate action? Now, I threw you a curveball here, and I'll tell you why here in just a second. We look at these waveforms, and again, we see another square pressure waveform. Why are we seeing a square pressure waveform? Well, that's because we are in pressure control. And that is supported by the decelerating flow pattern. Remember, we've already said this. Pressure control is always a decelerating flow pattern. So we see it come down, decelerate, and then exhalation happens. But here's the kicker. What do you notice about this waveform? What do you notice? Pause this video right now and answer this question and then restart it and see if you are correct. Here's what you notice. 
we fail to return to baseline on exhalation, which remember what that was? Air trapping. What do we need to do? Give a bronchodilator, administer PEEP, or find a way to make our expiratory time longer. Perfect. Decrease tidal volume. Well, that's not a bad answer. The problem is, is we are in pressure control, remember? And when we're in pressure control, we don't have control of tidal volume. We could decrease peak inspiratory pressure, but guess what? In pressure control, when you're setting pressure and controlling eye time, then even decreasing the pressure, yes, it will decrease the tidal volume, but it's different than when we're in volume control, like what we talked about on the previous slides. So you, you're still not gonna fix anything with decreasing the tidal volume. What about decreasing the inspiratory pressure? Well, that would have achieved decreasing the tidal volume, but it doesn't change how long this pattern holds. Decreasing the inspiratory pressure would just look like this. It would not change the eye time that we have set. What about decreasing the peak? Well, wait a second. If we need to treat air trapping, we said that increasing PEEP might would help, or adding PEEP, but not decreasing it, so that's not the correct answer. And then the last thing we have here brings us to the correct answer, which is we need to decrease our inspiratory time. So basically what we need to do is look at this and this, make it shorter, which will then increase our E time. So you have to recognize that when you're in pressure control, you are controlling eye time. If you're in volume control, if this had have been a volume control question, then we would have increased flow because that would have decreased eye time. So that's the pressure or the, the flow waveform. And you get to a point to where you can no longer eliminate one of them. You have to talk about them together. So we see where we're bringing the pressure waveform, which has already been discussed, in with the flow waveform. This will be followed up with the volume waveform discussion where we will be bringing back in these waveforms as well. <clears throat> you know where you can find me. I'm on all the socials, Instagram and TikTok at Respiratory Coach, Twitter at Coach RRT. Send me an email, respiratorycoach at gmail.com. Send me a text if you would like to join the texting platform, 817-968-7035. Like I finished the pressure waveform conversation. I have a cheat sheet over all this. If you want one, all you have to do is send me an email and I will send that cheat sheet to you. It's going to be all encompassing over the waveforms and our pressure volume loop as well as our flow volume loop. You have it in your hands. All you have to do is ask for it. That's the flow waveform. That's how you can get in touch with me. Remember, average is easy. Don't be it.